Hello. Today we're discussing Parsha Shemot. This is the first Parsha of the second book of Moshe of Moses, and the book is called Shemot Exodus. All sons of Yaakov have passed away, and the last one was Levi, who passed away at the age of 137. Now, what is taking place is a baby boom in, amongst the Jewish community in Egypt. The children of Israel multiply in incredible numbers. A lot of Jewish mothers uh, deliver six tablets. And um, this is one of the Hashem's miracles which was taking place. Well, on one hand it was good, on the other hand it was bad because um, threatened by their growing numbers, the Pharaoh uh, gets very scared. So, and when the, somebody as powerful as the Pharaoh was at that time um, becomes scared, he will take action. So, he decides to go the smart way about it and to enslave the Jews. Because he feels that, you know, if they become too numerous, they will take over the country and throw him out. So what he does is he announces that two cities, Ramses and Pitom, must be reinforced from whatever enemies and uh, suggests the, the, all the Jewish tribes to volunteer to help the Egyptians to uh, re reinforce those cities. And because we Jews are very patriotic people and we always help the country where we reside and we are very patriotic about it, uh, like they were obviously more Egyptian than the Egyptians and before the Second World War the German Jews were more German than the Germans and the Russian Jews during the revolution were more Russian than the Russians because they were the only communists and they were trying to, 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 to liberate Mother Russia, you know, from the, from the Tsars and etc, etc. So the, all the Jewish tribes agreed to participate with, with the, a lot of alacrity Except the tribe of Levi, which basically said, uh, we, uh, we will pray to Hashem, it's our job, we, we need to pray and we will not participate. Which was a smart move, because they were the only tribe, the Levis, which was never enslaved. So, how the Pharaoh did it? Initially, on the first day, the Pharaoh turned up together with his public servants and all the Egyptians, etc. And then slowly but surely, over the next few days or whatever weeks, they withdrew and Jews were the only ones working. And then they, and in the process, they implemented a system of uh, taskmasters, which were the Egyptians. And the taskmasters were controlling the Jewish leaders, the Jewish officers, which were apparently supposed to drive the Jewish people to work to work really hard. And this is how the slavery was implemented. Now, because this didn't work and the baby boom was continuing despite the hard labor, uh, Pharaoh calls the midwives, Shifra and Pua. And one of the Midrashic interpretations basically says that Shifra and Pua are the professional names for the uh, midwives. Why? Because Shifra stands for Shifir, which is the pneumotic fluid in uh, the woman, and there are a lot of uh, uh, Kabbalistic explanations to that. Even King David was, in one of his poems, was alluding to Shifir, which is the pneumonic fluid, the foundation of life, the pneumonic fluid. So that's why the midwives called Shifra and Pua, because she was pooing the babies, she was making them comfortable. That was the job of the other lady. Now, he calls those midwives and tells them, uh, commands them, that all the male babies must be killed at the time of birth. And only the females must be kept alive. However, they do not comply, and because they feared God. And because how can you imagine Jewish women who kill Jewish babies from Jewish mothers? You know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. So, uh, and because they didn't comply, Hashem basically uh, rewarded them with what is Torah says with the house. What does it mean? It means basically that Shifra, which was actually Yahaved, right, the leading two ladies, Shifra was Yahaved, became the mother of 
uh, Miriam, Aaron, and Moishe. And Pua, who is actually Miriam, she was, you know, so the King David and King Solomon were descendants of Miriam. Uh, because they coming from the tribe of Judah. She, so uh, that was their reward, because they didn't comply with Pharaoh's orders. Now, as a result of this, uh, Pharaoh decides, he commands all people, including the Egyptians, to cast their male babies into the Nile River. So let's go back to the story. So a child is born to Yahweh, the daughter of Levi. And her husband was Amram. Uh, and on Adar, uh, that took place on Adar the 7th of 2368. And that was her son, Yahweh's son, who later on will be named Moses or Moish. The Midrash is saying that the whole room was lit up in light when he came to this world. And uh, his powers, his future spiritual powers manifested immediately. Yehoved immediately understood that this is a, an unusual child and she uh, basically, uh, Moshe was born six months and one day old. So uh, she, Yehoved managed to keep him for three months um, secretly um, hiding him in the cupboard so that the Egyptians will not see him um, because the uh, Egyptians were expecting that uh, you know she'll deliver the baby uh, in nine months after she uh, basically got pregnant. Anyway, um, eventually when Yehavet saw that it becomes very dangerous to keep the baby hidden, she, because the Egyptians if they will find him, they'll kill him. So she puts the baby into the water in a basket and Miriam actually watches that basket from afar. It happened so and nothing in life is an accident so it was arranged by you know who, right? Pharaoh's daughter goes for a bus in the Nile River and discovers the boy and uh, she obviously needs a nursing maid to nurse the baby and it happens so that Miriam is very brave, approaches the princess and uh, basically in, introduces a Jewish nursing maid which the baby will uh, have the milk from which is obviously Yahweh and Batia, the daughter of Pharaoh, offers her that she will pay her if she will nurse the baby. So we have got a wonderful situation where Yahweh, the mother of Moshe, nurses the baby and uh, uh, she kept him uh, with her until Moshe was actually 12 years old. She managed to stretch the nursing arrangement for as long as possible. So Moshe was well aware of who he is, that he is a Jew. He was well aware of the hardships of his people. However, at the age of 12, Yehavet passed him on to Batia because that was the arrangement, the agreement with the with the princess. Now, uh, so now Moshe is a young man and he is already 18 and he discovers the hardship of his people, of his brethren. Now, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew severely and um, that's another long story actually about why this Egyptian was beating that Hebrew and um, he kills that Egyptian. The next day he sees the two Jews fighting, who do, their name is Datan and Aviram, and um, he tells them why you Jews are fighting. And their reply to him was, you know, who are you to tell us what to do? What, are you our leader or somebody? Are you going to kill us the way you killed that Egyptian? So Moshe gets very scared. Now, obviously, those two guys were, uh, act as informers and obviously betray Moshe and they, 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 they know that... Uh, uh, so they tell the Pharaoh about it and Moshe gets arrested. 
However, the persecutor cannot kill him because as soon as the as soon as the sword approaches his neck, it turns into marble. Eventually, Moshe manages to flee from Egypt. Now, the Torah basically tells us that Moshe fled from Egypt and went to uh, uh, Midian. Well, it's yes, eventually he finished up in Midian, but we will look into that a little bit deeper in a few minutes. So, uh, what I found in the Midrash that he actually fled to Ethiopia, where he joined the army, and nine years later he was crowned as a king. He was actually the king of Kush, which is now Ethiopia, for 40 years. Now, uh, you will say, hold on, what's going on here? Well, it's very simple. Moshe appears in Midian already at the age of 67. So he was 18 when he killed the Egyptian. And he, at the age of 67, appears in Midian. So where, where was he for the last, um, whatever it works out, 67, 18, 50 years, 49 years. Where was he? Now, the, the truth is that he, for nine years, he served in the Ethiopian army. And or after the ninth year period, he became the king of Ethiopia and reigned for 40 years. Why? Because the short part of the story is a very interesting story as well. But um, the king of um, Kush uh, died and left an offspring who was, was a, a very young baby. And because by that time, Moshe had a huge level of respect and authority by the military of Kush, so and the so he was basically elected to be the reigning king until the baby grows up. Now then, what happened? He was uh, forced basically to uh, to marry a, a Kush Kushite woman uh, who became the queen. However, he never ever had any relationship with her. And eventually, when the baby grew up, that Kushite queen complained to the elders and Moshe was basically forced to, uh, to pass his reign to, to this uh, other son of the existing uh, Kushite king. Now, so now in the year of 2434, at the age of 67, Moshe left Ethiopia and settled in the land of Media. Media. He thought that it was time to get married. So he went, did exactly the same thing as Jacob did, and he went and sat down near the well, and um, he, he decided that he will find a wife there. Uh, and what it happened so that Jetra relinquished his belief in the uh, idol worshipping and he became sort of uh, monotheistic he was um, uh, cut off by the community and so his seven daughters were forced basically to uh, shepherd the, his flocks of sheep uh, and they obviously those seven daughters came over with the sheep to, the, to this well where Moshe meets Sipora and she obviously falls in love with him and Moshe helps the girls to, to um, water their flocks the, right? and he protects them from the Midian shepherds and he becomes basically a shepherd for, uh, for, the, for uh, his father-in-law. So one day he pastures his flock his uh, uh, lens, and he finish, finishes up at, at the foot of Mount Horeb, which is later on called Mount Sinai. And in there he encounters 
uh, the angel of God in the form of burning bush which this angel instructs him to go to Pharaoh and to demand let my people go so that they may serve me their God and uh, the angel tells Moshe that Aaron will be appointed to serve as his spokesman um, in, in Egypt for, in front of the Jewish people as well as in front of the Pharaoh. And uh, Moshe and Aaron assemble all the elders of Israel to tell them that the time for redemption has come and that the Moshe is the redeemer and the people believe them. But Pharaoh refuses to let them go and even intensifies the suffering of Jewish people by removing the straw which was initially provided free now he tells them they must provide the straw themselves but the quarters of the number of bricks they should make remains the same. Moshe obviously immediately runs to God and uh, protests why have you done evil to my people? Um, however Hashem promises him that the redemption is close and will come and that's basically briefly the content of of the whole parsha. The question which I am asking is why Moshe uh, argues with Hashem for seven days. Hashem tells him you will go and will be my leader and you will lead the Jewish people, you will be the redeemer and Moshe argues and produces uh, four times he refuses basically Hashem's orders. Uh, and he initially starts with the answer who am I to lead and that answer basically it sounds like he is very humble because he says you know I, I don't have any spe special qualities and, and nothing well that's not entirely true he was already king of Ethiopia for 40, day, for 40 years he had a lot of experience in leading people and uh, so, uh, yes, he's being humble, but uh, Hashem obviously counteracts that and says, because I chose you, right? And then he says, they will not believe me. So he refers to the Jewish people that they will not believe him. And this is when Hashem tells him, all right, what is it you're holding in your hand? That uh, stuff, the walking stick. At that time, everybody was walking with a walking stick. Now, that stuff, actually, the walking stick, has got a very interesting history. Now, when um, Moshe joined Jeter as uh, future son-in-law for Sephora, he told him his story about his being, him being a king of Kush or Ethiopia. And Jeter didn't believe him and imprisoned him for 10 years. Uh, Sephora looked after him and he survived that imprisonment and after 10 years, basically, Jeter released him. And he was wandering about the backyard of Jeter, you know, somewhere. And he saw in there this sapphire stuff, which was basically molded into the ground. Right? Okay, there's another story. Jeter basically stolen that stuff from the treasury from Pharaoh. Anyway, and that was the same stuff as um, Adam was holding when he was created. Right? Anyway... So Moshe goes to that stuff and just pulls it out from the ground. And as soon as Jeter saw that uh, Moshe pulled out that stuff out, he was a prophet himself. So he knew that this is a very, very powerful spiritual person and, you know, uh, not, not, not somebody whom you should upset, actually. So he very quickly married him finally to Zipporah. And they had two sons, Gershon and Elizar. Um, now, uh, so Moshe, when Moshe says to Hashem, uh, they will not believe me, Hashem tells him, throw that stuff on the ground. And that stuff turns into the snake, not just any snake, the original snake from, from the Garden of Eden. Now, and Moshe, who wasn't easily scared, was running absolutely terrified. And... Um, uh, Hashem told him, stop, pick up that snake for its tail, and that snake turn, turned it back into the stuff. So Hashem tells him, basically, this is one of the miracles which you will demonstrate to the Jewish people as well as to the Pharaoh. And then he tells him about uh, 
the water which uh, will, if it touches the ground, will turn into blood, will turn into blood. And then because he, Moshe basically said that the Jewish people will not believe me, he basically said, Lushin Korah, he accused them. So Hashem demonstrates to him the following thing. He tells him, put your hand in your, uh, in your bosom, you know, here, and the hand turns white. Tzara, exactly the same thing which um, leprosy, basically, which uh, basically afflicted later on Miriam. And then Hashem tells him to put the hand in again, and it comes out absolutely healthy. And then Moshe argues the third argument, I am not a man of words. And uh, uh, Hashem counteracts that argument by saying to him, okay, fine, uh, I will be guiding you your tongue, and you will be talking, uh, you know, what I will say, because you are my emissary. You. However, Moshe is still not entirely happy. And the underlying reason for that because he was afraid to upset Aaron. And that's why Moshe comes up with the last argument. Please send someone else. And Hashem obviously can see what's going on and he tells him, look, Aaron will be your spokesman. Aaron will convey the message of the prophecy. You will be the prophecy. Why Moshe was so concerned with the whole idea of him being the redeemer and the leader of the Jewish people. Because he knew with uncanny precision what he will be, what he is letting himself into. He sensed very well in advance how hard it will be to manage those Jews, the stiff-necked, stubborn Jews, and um, the, to be their leader is uh, next to impossible. He was in some doubts where the Jews deserved their redemption because of this story of the, of the traitors uh, Datan and Aviram, you know, and he wasn't exactly sure about the, 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 the moral and ethical standards of those Jewish people. You know, when he approached the Datan and Aviram, the first thing they already, he wasn't even a leader yet, but, you know, they challenged his leadership qualities by saying to him, who are you to lead us and to tell us what to do? Uh, and these were the first recorded, actually, words spoken by, uh, spoken to Moshe by fellow Jews. And he basically was in uh, sincere, da sincere doubts about the quality of people he is dealing with. And as we know, Moshe's destiny, Moshe's, Moshe's life uh, was never easy. He was leading the Jewish, those stubborn Jewish people through the exodus, through the uh, parting of the sea, through, through the receiving of the Torah, through the 40 years in the desert, before he brought them to the land of Israel, and even then he wasn't allowed to enter the land of Israel. He never, his life never ceased to be difficult or often even demoralizing. If you recall it in uh, Belachatecha, he suffers what we call a nervous breakdown. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have, you, what have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all of these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? I cannot carry all these people by myself, he says. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. And this was said by somebody who was the greatest Jewish leader of all time. Why are we Jews almost impossible to lead? That's my question. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs comes up with an excellent answer. He says, the answer was given to by the greatest rebel against Moshe, Moshe's leadership, by the Korah. Listen carefully. 
to what he and his associates say. They came as a group to oppose this Moishe and Aaron and said to them, to oppose Moishe and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. The whole community is, is holy. Every one of them and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above, every, above everybody, above the whole Lord's assembly? The <laughs> Korak's motives were wrong. He spoke like a democratic leader, but what he really wanted is the dictatorship or autocracy for himself. He wanted to be the leader himself, but there is a hint in his words at what is actually at stake. Jews are a nation of strong individuals. And yes, the whole community is holy. Every one of us is holy and they always were and they still are and they always will be. This is our strength and this is our weakness. There were times when we found difficult to serve God, but they certainly would not serve anyone else. We do not serve anyone else. We are stiff-necked people, stubborn people, and people with stiff necks are hard to bow down. There is a good joke about it, modern joke. The two presidents, the Israeli president and the American president, doesn't matter who they are, really, sit down in a private conversation and the American president is complaining uh, about, uh, you know, difficulties in his country, the people going on strike and this and that and the problems, etc., etc. And the Israeli president is complaining about his problems in the country, political problems and the, 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 the sort of uh, division between people, etc. And the American president says to him, to the Israeli president, what are you complaining about? I have got more than uh, three, uh, 300 million people in there, in the country. And you have got only five to eight million people in the country now. But the Israeli president says, you see, the problem is you have got 300 million population. I have got five to eight million presidents. And this is what our problem is. We always think we are smarter than somebody else and we are very hard to lead. The prophets would not bow down to kings in the past, right? But the high could not bow down to Haman. The Maccabees would not bow, bow down to Greeks. The successors, the successors Romans had numerous troubles with the Jews. We Jews are fiercely individualistic and at the times it makes us unconquerable. We cannot be conquered and at the same time it makes very difficult to govern us. Almost impossible to lead. And this is what Moses discovered in his use when he was trying to help his people. And their first response was, who appointed you as a leader and a judge? And this is why Moshe refuses four times and debates with Hashem, none else than Hashem, debates uh, his potential forthcoming leadership because he knows how difficult it will be. However, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is saying it brilliantly, Israel needs our support at these critical times. And we can debate whether we should support Israel one way or the other, whether we should take unconditional support to Israel or we must ask Israel to do certain things. The answer is no. We unconditionally should support Israel in whatever they do. That makes us, our stubbornness makes us difficult to lead, but at the same time makes us unconquerable. So the, the good news and the bad go hand in hand. And what I can say is that we should probably try to conquer our stubbornness and to organize together, to mold together our resolve as Jewish people to stand up for Israel 
to support Israel in every way we can. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.